Welcome back. So um, <clears throat> just to give a very brief recap, yesterday I spent some time looking at the conversation we had last year, which revolved around the second creation story that appears in our scriptures. That is the story involving Eden, Adam and Eve, and so forth. And uh, talked about how Father Keating uh, and others have seen that as uh, through a contemplative lens, as really speaking to us about a God who in Christ rushes out to greet us in our exile to bring us home. And then I transitioned to the first creation story, which in fact um, is the later historically uh, that we know is the opening book, uh, the opening chapters of Genesis chapter one through two, four. And this is that beautiful repetitive ritualistic um, uh, rendition of creation in which God speaks a word and that word brings about its intended effect. Let there be light, let the oceans divide, let dry land appear, and so on. And I traced the way in which within scripture, we see the development of that idea throughout the history of Israel, spiritually speaking, and how that then informs our Christian theology, particularly our understanding of Christ. And so we saw from that word that becomes the creative force in which God moves from chaos to order, from that primeval ocean that is parted. We see that same image being, uh, we would say, recapitulated or repeated anew throughout the history of Israel. When the flood comes, uh, that in a sense, the, that big primeval ocean is, is actually restored back to covering up uh, the firmament or that dome or that space that God had created for order to appear. And um, through uh, 40 days and 40 nights of rain, we see a kind of cleansing of that original project of creation, but for the ark, which is the seed of all a human and animal life to move forward. And through the grace of God, it does, the waters recede and the earth is restored. And in that God makes the covenant with the whole of creation by placing this rainbow in the sky. And then that same image is carried forward in the book of Exodus, where we see once again, the God of Israel, who is fundamentally creator and redeemer, functions again in the same way to redeem as to create, which is to again, part the sea, to allow Israel to move beyond the chaos of, um, of being enslaved for centuries to the freedom and order of the promised land, the, the land flowing with milk and honey, as it were. And as those images are recapitulated, in other words, picked up again within the New Testament, we see the Gospel of John very clearly reiterating in his opening verses that that word that we heard about in Genesis, uh, bringing about the creation of all things, that very creative power of God, he says, has now been made incarnate uh, in Christ who walks the streets of Jerusalem and who you felt and touched and saw and heard with your own eyes, with your own ears and so on. And so from there, we see the first letter of Peter yet again, uh, look at this image of Noah and the ark of the great flood and sees in that a prefiguring of Christian baptism. And what he's essentially telling us is that this whole history of creation and redemption that is discernible throughout the trajectory of cosmic and human history, the whole action of God in the parting of the primeval ocean of the Sea of Reeds and so on. Now, each of us as baptized um, Christians are emerged, are plunged into that water, that primeval chaos, and which in a sense is death itself, and risen up again new, newly in Christ. And we see in that letter to Colossians, um, you have stripped yourselves of the old self and you have put on the new self. This is to say you have died to, to, um, to what is not Christ and have been raised in Christ again. And so the beauty of what we see unfold throughout the scriptural use of these, these images that keep getting taken up and built on one another is that the whole history of cosmic creation and salvation unfolds within every human heart. 
and we come to see in our own lives, in our own spiritual journeys, that it is um, Christ who is revealed in this big book of scripture, as well as the little book um, that we call the Bible. Today, what I'd like to do then is move from um, our reflection on the little book in that story of creation that opens Genesis to more of a reflection on the big book and a relationship between the two. Um, and this will lead us uh, later in the day to an invitation to practices which help get us away from theory and more into how we might move our way ritually and prayerfully into these truths that I'm trying to uh, help uh, you discern throughout scripture. Um, and that will be our focus for tomorrow, what it means to, um, to express these these truths, the reading of Christ in the little book and the big book, to see Christ in all things, how we pray our way into that. So let me start then with a prayer that I think expresses so beautifully uh, what I'll talk about as Christ as the one verse. Uh, the word universe, uni means one verse. Um, I've I've been playing with that idea that Christ is the one verse through whom the whole cosmos makes sense. It, he is the, um, the that divine force or pervasive power or presence that the diversity of the universe is unified under, the, the, literally the universe, the one verse. But let me read a beautiful um, prayer from the... Um, taken from the Carmina Gedelica out of the uh, Celtic Christian tradition that I think speaks beautifully to this presence of God as an all pervasive um, uh, presence in the, in the vast variety of what we discover in that big book of scripture. I am the wind that breathes upon the sea. I am the wave upon the ocean. I am the murmur of leaves rustling. I am the rays of the sun. I am the power of the trees growing. I am the bud breaking into blossom. I am the movement of salmon swimming. I am the courage of the wild boar fighting. I am the speed of the stag running. I am the strengths of the ox pulling the plow. I am the sap of the mighty oak tree. And I am the thoughts of all people who praise my beauty and my grace. So as we saw the creation narrative of Genesis presents creation arising out of the all powerful word of God, let there be light, let the upper and lower waters divide, let dry land appear, and God saw that it was good. We discussed a little bit of that movement from primeval chaos, which was symbolized by this expanse of um, ocean, uh, seemingly endless, um, and how from that chaos, God brings about order. In the pagan cultures of the time that Israel drafted its own uh, myth of creation, as we see here in Genesis, um, chaos is depicted almost universally as a violent force that is opposing the pantheon of gods. But, um, and, and in that sense, in a sense, chaos becomes in a sense, rivals to the gods. But we see a very clear distinction in the way that the author of Genesis understands uh, chaos. For one, chaos is not um, violent as we understand it in the first chapter of Genesis. It is not even in opposition to the power of God, much less a rival. It is rather what, what the author presents as a condition 
condition of purposelessness. It is meaninglessness. It is a state, in other words, in which we might say there is no time, no direction, um, nothing to find fulfillment in, no motion. There is only meaninglessness, a kind of fluctuation here and there, but no real orientation or direction. And what the divine act of creation does is brings meaningless, uh, meaningfulness to an otherwise meaningless void. So creation is about God imbuing direction, purpose, meaning. So instead of meaningless fluctuation with no direction, the cosmos that is created by Israel's God becomes intelligible. It becomes rational. It even becomes predictable. And the arena of history then is formed in which God or God's providential hand can now become discernible. And that's the meaning of our movement in Genesis from chaos to order, a movement from inability to see direction or purpose to one in which God's providence can be interpreted, felt, experienced, understood. And so we see the importance given in this beautiful creation account to the notion of direction of cycles, seasons, and times that can be depended upon for worship, for seeing God's hand. So, for example, um, one of the ways that we see that most clearly is in verse 14. God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them be signs for us for the seasons of the days and the years. So you see, the idea of the sun and the moon is to provide predictable um, time patterns, the rising and the setting, right? Uh, each day, each week, leading to the Sabbath rest, um, everything that could be now discernible um, is, is the capacity to discern God in all things, and therefore to be able to relate to God within this big book of scripture. And so for the author of Genesis, the opposite of chaos is not necessarily order per se, but the opposite of chaos is divine providence and the ability to discern divine providence. See? And so it is within this ordered universe imbued by the spirit of God, rendered by the eternal word of God, who we identify as Christ, it is in this universe that now um, worship can unfold. Intimacy with God can unfold. Right. In our Celtic rite that we use here uh, very frequently at St. Columba's, there is an opening collect that's used for most of the church year during the season of Pentecost. I, I would like to share that with you and just very briefly unpack it because um, the, the, the way in which this first story in Genesis is crafted, it is meant to serve within the context of liturgy. For those of you who are familiar with high liturgy, that is to say, you know, the Roman church or the Episcopal church, even the Lutheran church, where you have a very prescribed liturgy, this is intended in itself to uh, represent order. When we come out of the world, which feels like it's unhinged, and chaotic and falling apart, we move from that, uh, what we might call um, profane time, um, kairos, right, into this more sacred time in which we are elevated, I'm sorry, chronos would be your secular time into kairos, which is this more um, sacred time in which the chaos of the world around us is, is quelled even for a moment by the predictability of the liturgy, by the rhythm or the dance between the presider and the congregation. I say this and you say that, right? 
I, I offer this prayer, you respond with that prayer. We know when to bow, when to genuflect, when to make the sign of the cross. The predictability of the liturgy is meant not to induce boredom, although unfortunately I think it does sometimes, but the idea is to induce a sense of calm, of rhythm, of predictability, just the way these opening verses of Genesis are written. So I'd like you to hear one of our opening collects, that is to say the prayer that we pray toward the beginning of the liturgy that sort of collects our minds and hearts and as we gather from the craziness of the outside world, the chaos of the outside world, to a place wherein, in the liturgy, we can discern the presence of God. So hear how this whole prayer is designed to render a sense of predictability, presence, and um, tranquility. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, Look favorably upon your church throughout the world. By your mysterious providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. For all time belongs to you and all ages. We pray then in the fullness of your time, bring all things to perfection in Christ, through whom all things were made who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God of love forever and ever. Amen. So you see here the very sense of this is what the Genesis author is, is getting at, this capacity to discern the tranquility of God who faithfully, stalwartly and unceasingly renders, brings about creation newly in every moment and brings about the plan of salvation that we can rely upon, we can trust. So no matter how chaotic the world seems, we can trust that beneath it all is this steadying, providential, tranquil hand of God directing human history. And I'm gonna come back to that concept in just a moment. So what we find in the ancient church, indeed in the ancient world, all the way up through the medieval period, let's say up until about 1500, we'll come back to that date momentarily, is that this so-called big book of creation or the big book of scripture that we call creation meant that the, because God brings about order, discernible order out of chaos, that creation then, as the handiwork of God, was seen to be inherently a kind of sacred language all unto itself, a symbolic order with inherent spiritual meaning, right? So the whole world, the, the, the flora, the fauna, right, animals and plants abound, each of them carried a certain symbolic meaning. Each of them were a diversity of words expressing the one true word who is Christ through whom all things came to be. Christ remains that unifying word beneath the spectrum or plethora or almost infinite array of diversity of created words, squirrel, tree, mountain, rock, stone, ocean. These are the infinite number of words that that unified word beneath it all, who is Christ, becomes expressed in this, this beautiful display of, um, of variety and diversity. And so um, for the early church, it's important for us to know that whether we're talking about the little book, the Bible, or the big book, creation, Christ becomes the lens through which all of it is properly understood and interpreted. Christ becomes that unifying factor in which, say, the Old Testament and the New Testament, which can seem so disparate, begin to be formed into a cohesive whole, a kind of structure or um, trajectory in which everything from Adam and Eve all the way to Revelation takes on a kind of purposeful whole, uh, a, a connected story that we can weave all these disparate parts to see how God has unfolded uh, his... Um, his ongoing revelation ultimately in Christ. And so Christ becomes the very lens through which both scripture and creation become properly interpreted. And this is where we get that notion of the big and the small book. 
for the vast majority of Christian history then, both scripture and creation were indeed interpreted with this sense of an inherent value. Creation was seen as inherently valuable um, because it was this symbolic structure, this means of communication, this um, medium of grace or primordial sacrament through which God is expressed in the world. But that begins to change in around the year 1500. And I want to give you a very brief sketch of that change that happened. And because we are still living in the wake of the tragedy of that change and don't even know it. Just a quick show of physical hands. How many of you know what I mean if I talk about post-modernity? How many of you feel like you have a sense of that? I'm going to explain it very quickly to you as it pertains to this subject. It's a much more complicated subject, but I'm going to keep it very brief. So if you, if you talk about post-modernity, it implies modernity, because you have to have modernity if you're going to be post-modernity, right? <laughs> you have to have a modernity. And there is also then a pre-modernity. And these are three ages I want to just point to very quickly with regard to this discussion. I say they're really much bigger concepts. Pre-modernity is everything we would mark prior to the year 1500. In other words, a world before science came on the, the human scene, right? That's why it's, it's basically around the, the, uh, the um, introduction of science, the industrial revolution. These all bring about the modern world. So everything that's before the industrial revolution, uh, the age of the enlightenment in which reason becomes the central way of thinking. I'll come to that in a moment. And before science really begins to inform the world as it has now. So all of that up to 1500 is the pre-modern world. The one thing I want you to know about pre-modernity with regard to our conversation today is that it was assumed culturally, at least within Western culture, that God was at the center of human history and because of that, we could rely on the fact that history would always move toward a place of betterment because God is at its center, pushing, nudging, right? Bringing all of human history to a place of betterment and that that could be trusted and relied upon as a given fact. God is at the center and therefore we will forever continue to improve. Around the 1500s and into the late 1900s, we see the onset of, as I mentioned, the industrial revolution, scientific inquiry, the age of the enlightenment, which simply means this in, for our purposes, God gets sidelined in this process. And what takes center stage is human reason, the human mind. Um, in a pre-modern world, if a priest said, hey, this is true, you believed it because authority came from the Bible. Authority came from the church. Religious authority was assumed. By the time you get to the enlightenment, by the time you get to the introduction of science and reason, that undermines all of that religious authority. And by the way, rightly so in my opinion, right? Uh, in other words, the question became, how do we now discern betterment? It isn't God who, who's at the center of human history, according to the humanists of the Enlightenment. It is the human mind. It is reason. It is science. And therefore, with science, we can produce machinery and medicine and all these things that make human life better, improved, extending uh, the individual human life and so on. And so what happens with the 1500s forward, what we call the age of modernity now, science replaces God, reason replaces religion. And here the underlying assumption is the same, but with a different center. It is human reason, it is science, it is the intellect that will guarantee the human species will forever move toward betterment. And for a while, it seemed that way. The introduction of vaccines 
machines that made our lives easier, agricultural advances, right, that allowed for the flourishing of education and science and arts because we all weren't running around trying to figure out where our next meal was coming from and so forth and so on. Transportation, airplanes, connecting people from around the world. For a long while, it looked as though we were right. Enter the 20th century, the 1900s. The 1900s were the most violent history, century in the history of humanity. More people died of war in the 1900s than in every century combined prior. In the 19th century saw the machinery of national politics gone awry in the Nazi uh, in Nazi Germany where 11 million people were put to death right we see genocide upon genocide Side. We see the introduction of the scientific capacity to now drop bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki with indiscriminate destruction of every man, woman, and child in its wake. We see the Korean War, the Vietnam War, um, and so forth and so the Khmer Rouge. I mean, these horrific um, developments of despotic governments combined with science has led to untold destruction. We call this the terror of history. And it is what inaugurates what we now call post-modernity. Because what it challenges, see, the, what pre-modernity and modernity have in common is this. They both believe that the, that the world is necessarily moving toward a better and better place. For the pre-moderns, it was God who would, who would assure us that. For the moderns, it was science who would assure us of that. In the postmodern world, that shifts altogether. What we learned in the 1900s, which shifted us from modernity to post-modernity, is that there is no guarantee that we are in fact moving toward a course of betterment. In fact, for the first time in human history, we now and forever will live under the threat of total annihilation in a matter of hours because of our nuclear arsenals, you see? So now we are living perpetually under the existential, existential threat of destruction at human hands, at the hands of science. In addition to that, what has happened is that science as it has risen up during the course of the enlightenment has in a sense staked its claim on the material world. And religion, particularly Christianity, has continued in response to recede from the material world, becoming much more dualistic. There's the internal world of the spirit that belongs to Christianity. The external world now belongs to empiricism, objective science, right? Um, um, farming, agriculture, all these industries are left beyond uh, the, the, the realm of religion, which used to see this unified whole, now we have an antagonistic relationship of humanity versus nature, man versus nature, overcoming nature, exploiting nature for our own good. And we can all guess where that's led us now to the brink of ecological destruction. The, the beauty of the postmodern world view has been to question everything, to not necessarily assume that any one person's truth is the truth, and to really doubt whether any singular claim to truth can be anything but a dangerous tyrant to the rest of the world. Because when any one group, be it national, political, philosophical, religious, claims to have that one singular truth, the inevitable outcome over and over and over again is the use of violence to force others to believe that truth. And whether that's Christian ways of evangelizing in, in our ancient past, where we took to the sword to evangelize, or democratic nations trying to impose democracies on Middle Eastern countries that have never known democracy and has become a complete disaster, any time we, or the, the maniacal regime of the Third Reich who tried to literally take over the world with its ideology of, of Aryan um, um, supremacy, 
Whenever you have a, a view that claims to be the only truth, it leads to violence in an attempt to impose that truth. This is what we learned in the last century. So the, the bright side of postmodernity is a desire for inclusivity, the celebration of diversity, but that leads us to a place of also a profound disconnect. We don't share a common language with even our closest neighbors. We don't have a common worldview that we can rely upon in talking with people who we work with in our own families who live down the block. And so you have this, this huge diversity, uh, explosion of diversity that leads us with very little roots or grounding or worldview by which to orient our lives. Nicholas, please. Yeah, Vincent, I, I see the, the shift between pre-modernity and modernity. Could, I, I may have missed it, but I don't see what changed to make it post-modernity from modernity. If you could clarify that, please. Absolutely. So the parallel between modernity, uh, pre-modernity and modernity is that there is some, some center that holds, for pre-moderns it's God, for moderns it's science, and that that center assures us of a continual movement toward betterment. Either God's providential hand will, will sort of guarantee that we're constantly moving toward a better place, or science will, will, will think our way into better and better and better solutions. And in many ways it has, right? I mean, medicine and science and, and, and all of this has improved our lives. There's no question about that. What shifts between modernity and post-modernity is that assumption that we are necessarily guaranteed to keep moving to a place of betterment. That in other words, our whole future for the first time in human history is understood to be held in the balance. We now have weapons of war that could destroy Destroy the whole planet in a matter of hours. We are now facing a new extinction based on human interference with the natural processes of nature and so on. So we are living with existential threats without the promise that there's a solution or a way forward that we can guarantee. So we are left with this place of, of mistrusting any kind of claim by any institution that they have the one truth because we've seen the disasters that has led to. So we don't have a, a groundedness anymore and a certain sense of truth. And with that, we have no real sense that we are necessarily moving toward a place where we will forever improve. In fact, the opposite is true. We now know we have a tremendous capacity for the opposite. Right? And that, frankly, is a terrifying place to be in history. It's disturbing. Um, and, and our faith now. So, so what I want to talk about today and then certainly more tomorrow is what does the contemplative say to all of this? How do we live into our contemplative life in this world? How can we be agents of light, of unity, of change without imposing a worldview, but finding a way to embrace the diversity of worldviews that postmodernity celebrates? You understand. Okay. So any questions about that? I mean, all of the, uh, you know, in fairness, I have completely oversimplified those three eras of, of our, of our history, but all I want to do is point out the value they have for this conversation and what shifted and, and that most people don't even know that they, how informed we all are by a pro postmodern world. You, we just don't get it. We don't see how much our ideas just have absorbed and therefore assume these ideas that our ancestors wouldn't have ever even considered. So it's important to make ourselves aware of the cultural, philosophical sort of worldviews that are shaping us, whether we realize it or not. And that's the point here. Yes, Carol. I think that the huge rise in suicide among young people really proves what you are saying. It, you know, it does. Uh, it also, by the way, as we'll see momentarily, it also is why we have such strong fundamentalist religious views today, because the world is not black and white. In the pre-modern world, you knew, you knew you were being saved if you were Catholic and European. And that, that's sort of where it went. You know, you weren't living next door to a Muslim on one side, a Jew on the other, a Buddhist across the street, where you had such radically different worldviews that could ju are just completely 
completely irreconcilable. You know, if you grew up in medieval um, France, you probably never met anybody who wasn't Catholic, you know, at least nominally so. So there was no challenge to your worldview. So there was a strong sense of we're right. This is whatever. Doesn't everybody think like this? Isn't this how the whole world looks? And then suddenly in our world, we know we can't take that for granted. And there's a beauty if we can stretch to explore and embrace the other, learn from them. But for many people, it's so terrifying that the reaction is to retract into a fundamentalist. I'm right, you're wrong. And what's behind that is fear. I'm terrified about my, my spiritual existential well-being. So I'm going to retract into a safe black and white world where I know where God is, where my relationship to God is, and that must make everybody else wrong, but I feel safe in my rightness. And, and so, Carol, your point is that there's so much insecurity and it comes out in so many different ways in this, in this current world we're living in. And we're not even sure why, why we're feeling it all. But this is essentially the underlying shifts over, to, over the course of centuries that lead us to where we are today. And Pamela, I'm sorry, I just saw your hand there. To um, add to what Carol said, uh, I have adult children who are... Uh, of that postmodern context who really struggle with depression and anxiety, uh, in particular one who's a very old soul and is very sensitive to these currents of the environment. And it's very difficult to have any you know, sense of the future or any sense of place. Uh, so that's, I did wanna just add a personal anecdote to that. But the second thing that your context of um, history was important because it actually made me understand the importance of Teilhard de Chardin, how radical he was in terms of being a scientist, but also uh, really believing in that omega point of God that he wrote about, that we are really being pulled toward the future and the future is drawing us something. And as a scientist and a religious, to say that was really radical at the time, which obviously was why he was silenced as well. Right. Right. But you've given me kind of a greater appreciation of his role and his voice. That's right, Pamela. And you know, you, you know, when you speak about your adult children, if I if I just jotted down, I think you said one of the things I struggle with is a sense of place and direction, if I remember right. Um, you know, to, I want to uh, point to that to echo your question of yesterday about the way chaos is understood. That is the kind of chaos that the Genesis author is really trying to address: a sense of directionlessness, a sense of non-placeness, a sense of you know, not, and what order is, is not, it is really providence then, is that pulling, that that trust in that omega point, that providence is indeed pulling us to, drawing us toward that point. And that, that's what makes for the Genesis author, um, the opposite of, of chaos is not order, it's providence, it's purposefulness, meaningfulness. And that becomes predictable in an ordered universe, that becomes discernible in an ordered universe, right? So I hope that maybe helps clarify that because I know that might've been a sticking point for you, but it's exactly your children's experience. And in fact, our global experience, I think, that, that we're finding this kind of cultural chaos of, of disordered, of, of not being grounded or rooted and so forth. I am firmly convinced, I arrived at St. Columba's in January 1st, of, actually of 2017. So we're coming up on just four and a half years now. There were seven people in this congregation. It was absolutely dying. We are now hovering at about a hundred. And the reason for that, I believe, is that the vision I brought to it was to create a place of spiritual intimacy. And I think that is what we are so lacking. And to be very frank with you, I can only claim some credit for holding that initial vision. You know, I, I tell my community, just like in a wedding vow, you know, to have and to hold, I, you know, I could have a vision, but it takes a community to hold that vision. And that's what's happening, that the, the, the community is, be, is inculcating, is really embodying that sense of spiritual intimacy in which meaning is found. And it's not found because we're imposing a top-down theology that everybody has to embrace before they can walk in the door. 
It's found in an authentic community that can together ask very hard questions and live into the answers together, right? Um, and that's what I think people need. We need, you know, that whole pre-modern world in which father knows best and you have to believe this because I'm the priest and I said so, just isn't going to fly in a world in which people are educated uh, and savvy and don't need a, an educated priestly class to be the elite, you know, academics among everyone. I mean, it, we're, the, community, the world is too smart for that. And now the question of the church is how do we engage in the gifts of what the congregants bring, their experience, uh, their insights, whether they're psychologists or scientists or or mothers, you know, and so how what is that? In, how does that all inform our theology? So we live into these answers together, and and what I have to help in terms of the woundedness that people have come to this community with uh, after not stepping foot in a church for forty years until now um, is this. Uh, this idea that so many people have absorbed that they're not allowed to ask questions or that somehow that that's that's a lack of that symbolizes a lack of faith rather than a vibrant faith well every theologian in the history of the church is great because they asked great questions and they tried to help the church live into meaningful answers nobody becomes a great theologian because you have no questions that's ridiculous right? That's just robots. That's automatons. So the point of the faith community is to enter into the mystery of the tradition, into the language and symbolic force of the tradition, and in that frame questions. And as, as Bernard Cook, one of my theolo- uh, professors in um, Boston College, when I was in uh, my master's program there, said, a good, the, uh, you, we don't measure theology by the answers we arrive at. We measure our theological growth by the types of questions we ask. That's what we have to pay attention to. What types of questions are, how are they getting more beautiful, more sublime, more intricate, more complex? And how do we move through those in ways that expand rather than restrict, or restrict us into these more myopic ways of thinking? strong theology, deep spiritual practice, uh, a, a life, a contemplative life fully lived is one that is expansive, not myopic, that is constantly opening to the world, not closing in on oneself. Right. Uh, Jenny, please. So would it be correct to say that as a result of this postmodern, I'm going to call it chaos, uncertainty, um, that there are people who have, in order to to cope with that, they have moved themselves into a pre-modern way of living. And so that's manifested, for instance, in the anti-vax people, Um, some other some other ways of of thinking that are really in conflict, but it's part of their coping mechanism to be into that more pre-modern mindset. Would that be correct to say? I think it is. I think the way Keating would talk about that is, is resorting to mythic member consciousness, right? Us against them. And that could be very fun and frivolous, you know, my high school team versus yours and rah, rah. But when that gets played out in life, as, as we're seeing, um, uh, we see more and more so how um, politically in this country, nobody can even talk anymore. I, I was talking to someone and said it's almost as if for a Democrat and a Republican or a progressive and a conservative to talk anymore, you need, you need therapy. You need a mediator the way a couple who's on the verge of divorce needs a marriage counselor to have a meaningful conversation. I mean, it just immediately becomes explosive and dehumanizing and, and totally unhelpful on, on every front. And that gets exacerbated by the fact that we keep all listening to the one uh, the, the one voice that, that now makes more and more sense and blocking out any messages that are coming from the voices that we feel so hostile toward and we become more and more entrenched. And somehow for the church to be a reconciling force in the world, we cannot continue to replicate that. We can't, right? We have to somehow hold a sacred space in which we don't allow that to happen to our congregations. And it's very, very difficult. 
Here we see again, Christ becomes the unifying lens. You know, as we read in Colossians, neither Gentile nor Jew, slave or free. Well, we may as well say neither Democrat nor Republican, conservative nor liberal. I mean, whatever. Those are the radical terms we have to see that Christ is reconciling in our own world. And how do we as church live into that? I come as a matter of confession from a rather progressive part of the world. We're here just north of San Francisco in West Marin, uh, a very, very sort of ecologically conscious, progressive minded group. Uh, my deacon uh, recently asked if we would put a pride uh, flag, a rainbow flag at the bottom of the driveway. And um, knowing that I'm gay, she thought for sure that I would just say absolutely. And I said, as long as I'm here, that will never, ever happen. And the reason is because though that flag will turn away as many people as it may draw. What is that flag saying? That if you struggle over the issue of marriage equality, you're not welcome here because we're all of one mind about that issue or our vicar is of one mind about that issue. Isn't it my role to ensure that people who grapple with that are allowed to experience me, my partner, to see a community for whom this is really not a major issue at all? In fact, it's the only issue is a celebratory one uh, where I have you know, done my best to dedicate myself to this parish. Um, why should this, so, so symbols like that, um, tweets, flags, uh, signs, um, are, you know, they, they speak as much to, um, let me rephrase it, the voices of the people not coming to my church are as important as the voices who are, because the question is, what's stopping them? What is it about St. Columba's that isn't speaking to them? We have to pay attention to that question, right? So I told my deacon, the real prophetic thing to do in such a progressive part of the world would not to be to put a rainbow flag at the bottom of our driveway, but to say Trump voters are welcome. Because that would be saying the Samaritan, the Pharisee, the tax collector in this part of the world. Now, maybe in Waco, Texas, a, a flag, a rainbow flag might be a little bit more prophetic, but not here, right? So I'm not ever going to put a Trump sign or a rainbow flag or a BLM sign at the bottom of my driveway because the harder thing to do is to embody that compassion, embody that inclusivity, not, not determine who's going to come up the driveway in the first place. Not to be a gay church or a progressive church or a conservative church, but a Christian church. And in that, for people who come, whether they're Trump voters or gay or you name it, progressive or liberal, will feel a warm and loving embrace of Christ by this community. That much I could guarantee. If I can get you in the door, you will be loved on. And I'm not about to put a sign up at the bottom of my driveway that determines who comes up in the first place. You see, this is very important. And the church has to be very careful about how it presents itself in the world, because we each then, not just as an institution, but as individuals, have to understand that our, our singular commitment to Christ is not a retractive one in which we cocoon ourselves into a little world but is an expansive one in which we embrace the whole world. I'm not sure how many of you know this, but you're familiar with the St. Peter's Square um, in, in the Vatican. And if you look at St. Peter's and the plaza in front, in front of it, there are these two rounded arch uh, corridors with column, the colonnades. I'm sure you're familiar with that. I don't know how many of you know that is the symbolism of that is Mother Church embracing the world. Those are the arms of the church embracing the world. Now, to what extent an individual um, denomination actually lives up to that is, of course, a, a question. And it is, is oh, you know, times it does so better or worse. But the, the intention of that architecture is beautiful. To embrace the world. Carol? I get so excited because you everything you say brings me back to the vision statement of contemplative outreach, which we are grappling with that we are not a top-down organization. That's, or hierarchical, I think is the word Keating uses. But that's hard for us. We want people to tell us what to do. And the other thing, there's a, 
another principle that says we don't embrace political, um, I mean, I can't quote it, but we don't support any political or sociological um, initiatives. People can individually, but as, as contemplative outreach, we don't want to turn anyone away or turn anyone off. I mean, those are my words, but Keating puts them in there. And those are, have been hard principles and guidelines to follow in chapters who have great ideas, let's do this. And so I really appreciate this conversation because it's putting the finger on some real day-to-day -day challenges we're meeting within contemplative outreach. And your words are inspirational. Thanks, Carol. Yes, I agree. And I'm familiar with the contemplative outreach principles around that. And they're, they're wise and they, and, and they are difficult, right? But remember that within the time of Christ, it, within, the, within the churches of Paul, I mean, by Paul trying to unite Jews and Gentiles under, the, under a unified faith in Christ was like pulling eye teeth. I mean, these are communities who really had little, if anything, to do with one another and often had great disdain for one another. Um, and the, see, just what Jesus rails against in, in, in what had become of Judaism, particularly Pharisaic Judaism, is precisely, Carol, the, what you just said. We, there's a sense in which we want to be right because it we want to know we're right because it makes us feel safe. And when our existential spiritual lives are on the line, wow, do I want to feel safe. When my eternal well-being is at stake. I need to feel safe. I need to know I'm going to be one of the saved, right? This is a scary question. And so religion, while in its inceptions, wants to free us, the mechanisms of preserving the gospel in this case become more and more and more about rules and regulations and right and wrong and in and out and not coloring outside the lines. So as Jesus, for example, uh, really uh, um, goes to bat with the rigidity of the Pharisaism of his day to free people, right? I'm pronouncing all foods clean. You know that purity cannot be by ritual, but by what comes out of the heart. You know, all of these things in which he calls us to deeper intention, deeper prayer, right? Deeper um, intentionality around who we are and how we behave in the world. We see this initial burst where Christianity is freed from the shackles of the law, as it were, from the shackles of Pharisaism. But by the time you get to Martin Luther, the church had again become a system of rules and regulations and go to confession here and then do this and say this many Hail Marys. And if you do this or give this money that your Aunt Millie, who's suffering in hell, will have 100 years shaved off. And all of these sort of transactional ways in which suddenly we've become, Christianity took on a new Pharisaism, retracted in fear. And what Martin Luther said is, we have to reinvent the church. We have to reform. We have to break free within Christianity from the new shackles to restore the freedom that Christ intended in the gospel. And the reform movements and the Protestant churches have grown out of that. And in its own way, the Roman Catholic Church has indeed done its own internal reform around that. Um, but, but you see that tendency from freedom to restriction, and it's all based on fear and safety. Pamela, please. I'm also so inspired by what you're saying. And I woke up this morning, I don't know why, wondering if I was a Christian. Hmm. And what I came to in pondering it is that if being a Christian means to love God and to love my neighbor, then I am. Then I can claim that as my life's intention and, and a devotional practice. But all the other things are in question to me. All the other, you know, what you just described is all the ways that it becomes more and more constricted just doesn't fit with I mean, what the contemplative path has given me is actual experience. So all those constrictions are so easy to see through. Mm -hmm. And I do think the contemplative path is one of those ways outside of the institutional church that continues to just create that expansion 
and that that reformation of what we know God to be mm-hmm. and know Christianity, the full potential of it. Right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Pamela, beautifully said. Um, yes, I would agree. To love God and neighbor um, is to be a Christian. And I might add to that, to be a Christian disciple is to embody that love of God and neighbor. We see, for example, in Matthew 25, um, you know, when in the great um, return of Christ in the end times, as it were, uh, when he's seated on his throne and he says, I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats, right? The sheep are the, the saved, the goats are the damned, as it were. And um, I'm you can say he's going to say to the sheep, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me, thirsty, you gave me to drink, in prison, you visited me, in the hospital, you helped me, and so forth. Notice the question, but when did we do that for you, Lord? Whenever you did it to the least of my sisters and brothers, and then come all the goats. Whenever you f- saw me hungry and failed to feed me, failed to give me drink, failed to visit me in prison, well, when did we fail to do that to you, Lord? Whenever you failed to do it to the least of my sisters and brothers. Now, a few things that I think are profoundly important of, of that parable for this conversation. I've, I love uh, Olivia Clement, who's an Orthodox theologian, wrote an amazing book called The Roots of Christian Mysticism. It is literally in pieces by my prayer bench. It is like second to the Bible to me. It's awesome. It's basically a handbook of patristic thoughts on all of these beautiful things. Um, But basically, he says, what we have to realize from a contemplative reading of this parable is that the sheep and the goats are not two different kinds of people. They're two aspects of every person. So there's no ultimate dualism here where I'm saved and you're not, because the reality is sometimes I'm a little bit sheep and sometimes I'm a little bit goat. And what this, this parable is essentially saying is that all that is sheep in you, all that is love of God and neighbor is, go, is in itself salvation, is what is being brought into foreverness, right? Into eternity. And whatever is not love of God and neighbor, whatever is selfish and egocentric and false self, all of that gets burned away. Evil has no future. Only good, only love has a future. Only within me, only what is within me that is love has a future. All else gets burned away. Only that a sheep within me has a future. The goats, as it were, get burned away. And what's beautiful about this too is notice how nothing about salvation has anything to do with where you go to church or whether you go to church or what your particular beliefs are about Jesus or God or doctrine. It's about whether you embodied love of God and neighbor, full stop. I would like to say that we as Christians have the privilege of seeing Christ where the people he spoke to didn't, right? Where, when did we do this for you, Lord? Whenever you did it for the least. The joy of being Christian is not the joy of being saved apart from everybody else. The joy of being Christian is knowing that we're all saved, knowing that there's a providential hand of God, knowing that Christ is in all things, knowing that when I feed the poor, it is Christ I feed. When I give drink to the thirsty, it is Christ I give drink to. It's the, it's the intimate relationship that intimate spiritual communities inculcate and embody. That's the joy of being Christian. That's the purpose of it. It's not simply because, oh, now we'll be saved. It's not the point. Mary Jane, did your hand go up there? I thought so. Yeah. Yes, Vincent, thank you. Um, What's occurring to me, well, this is something that's just been growing in me a lot lately, is that, you know, a lot of the human, the New Testament is still very anthropocentric in its language and the way it speaks. Um, I think this passage might be talking about not just your human neighbor, but all, all of our created neighbors and the way we t- treat one of the least of them is the way we treat Christ. And um, yeah, and I've had a little side conversation with, with Kathleen too, because we don't like that this, there's such a dualistic idea around the sheep and the goats. Goats are pretty good creatures too, so. 
They are. Yeah, That's poor goats get a, <laughs> I feel like goats and buses get a bad rap. And people always say, okay, if I get hit by a bus, why is it always a bus? Nobody says if I get hit by a train or if I get hit by, it's always a bus. If a bus runs me over, uh, the key is in the back room there, just so you know. Why? Buses get a totally bad rap in our side, but goats get a bad rap too. But that's because just in, in just to put, give you a little context, goats were seen as profoundly disobedient and stubborn. And so they just kind of become, uh, you know, the, um, <laughs> I see you clapping, Kathleen. Uh, so they kind of get the bad rap of where sheep are the more docile and so on. Um, but, but yes, to your point, one of the um, expansions of reading the book of the little book and the big book um, is to uh, is to ask that question, and I and I this is a question I threw out to you last year about the nets when Christ calls us to discipleship. If you look at all of the um, uh, sort of quintessential narratives around the call to discipleship, Jesus is meeting his disciples usually on the shore of Tiberias or somewhere, and they're out casting nets for fish, and he says, "Drop your nets and come and follow me." And the point I make in my book, and I'll reiterate, I, I'm almost certain I would have raised this last year, is that he's not asking us to get a bigger net. If you want to be fishers of people, then drop your nets and follow me. So the idea is nets become invariably exclusive. No matter how big your net, there's a lot more fish in the sea than you'll ever capture in it. So the only way to become a disciple of Christ is to drop the nets altogether, to leave your nets behind. And your nets are the dividing line where you demarcate us and them, we and they, you and me. And wherever the boundary of your net is, marks the boundary of your compassion. So the point is, when we expand our nets and ultimately drop them, there, it's it's the boundary of compassion that's expanding to be all inclusive, and to your point, Mary Jane, if we if we didn't know it before now, we certainly need to know it now, that our boundary of compassion cannot stop with humanity, that we have to show compassion for our planet. Several years ago, I published a chapter in a book on climate change that was written by, a, 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 it's an edited piece by multiple theologians. And I use this Colossians hymn that we've been studying as the basis for an ecological um, sort of um, approach to climate change from a Christian point of view. And one of the ways that I end that um, is to say, look, the, the planet is the body of Christ now being crucified. And it's to those wounds that we are urgently called to attend. Christ is being crucified in the destruction of this planet. And we have to attend to those wounds. Uh, I saw um, not long ago, a few weeks ago, uh, a, a very brief documentary called Breaking Boundaries. You can probably find it on Netflix or something. I would recommend it. And it is a very... Um, very clear assessment of, of the various sectors of the environment, rainforests, oceans, ice caps, and uh, ozone layers, and so forth, and how, how far we've come in each of those sectors toward dangerously destructive levels. And so they break it down that way. And, and, and the point is we're, we have broken the boundaries of safety in most every one of them. But for each one of these sectors, the documentary takes a, a, a particular ecological location to explore and has a scientist guide us through what's happening there. It was heartbreaking to see empirical, rational-minded, solidly intellectual scientists break down into tears over what they're seeing. The destruction of um, the, uh, um, the coral reefs, the bleaching of coral reefs off of Australia. And when you see the pictures of this, I mean, it is just heart withering. You just cannot believe what's happening before our very eyes. Um, when you see the destruction of the fires in Australia and this woman who for, for decades was studying entire bird populations that have been decimated. Uh, literally billions of animals have been killed in these fires in Australia. Um, it, the, the damage, the, the destruction is heartrending. This is Christ crucified. 
How do we keep vigil before this cross? What is the healing balm we bring as contemplatives? And where is the resurrection in all of this? It's devastating. So Mary Jane, to your point, I could not agree more wholeheartedly. Um, I actually start to bristle at the idea of social justice because it's so anthropocentric, so human-centered. I feel like we have to look at planetary justice, ecological justice. Um, we have to broaden the way we think of not just humans. I mean, it's all connected. Human issues of social justice and oppression are connected to the climate issue. But the more we move into this postmodern world where particularities have been deconstructed, what we're seeing emerge is a bigger picture of a deeper unity. And that is looking at the planet. There's just no way to get around the fact that if this planet goes down, we go down with it, full stop. Our, our very lives as the species is on the line here. It's just that serious. One more point on that, I guess, Vincent, is I find that understanding of um, keeping vigil so helpful because it gives, uh, for me, for sure, it gives a place for us to be in the midst of this right. instead of like this awkward feeling, you know, that we have, what can we do? We can't, you know, we can't change everything. Um, we're headed somewhere. We can work to change for sure. But, um, and I will just say on a personal note, having sat with my beautiful dear partner who passed last summer and that experience in a way helped me so much understand what we need to be doing with the earth, like to, to be sitting, to be with, to celebrate, to be with every last breath that we're all able to share. Um, not, not to be like, you know, and the thing is, we don't know, we don't know what will happen with the planet, but we know it's suffering right. terribly right now. So anyway, I just thank you for that idea of the vigil because it's it's really helped me in my relationship with what's going on. Well, firstly, uh, Mary Jane, let me say, I'm very, very sorry for that loss of yours. I, I had no idea that you are so recently, you know, struggling with that. It's uh, grief is um, a terrible um, place to have to traverse. And as much as it gifts us with so much over time, um, it is the valley of the shadow and it is a painful time. And uh, we discover, I think, in our grief, the depths of love um, and the struggle to express that love um, uh, in a world in which our loved one is no longer with us in that beautiful and deep spiritual sense, that incarnate sense that's so meaningful to us. So I'm very sorry for your loss. And I think that your your, what you've taken from that is exactly right. I've often used the analogy when people say, well, it's too late, the planet's going down, there's nothing we can do. My first response is if you had a loved one that was given a terminal illness, would you just walk out the door and say, well, it's too late, you're dying anyway? No, that you intensify your compassion, you intensify your vigil keeping, you provide as much palliative care as you can, and you find a way to make life still meaningful and beautiful even though what we're facing may be something quite beyond what any of us are prepared to accept. So um, we, we have to um, understand that our role as contemplatives in the world, as, as contemplative Christians in the world, is to take, if ever we're going to take seriously the incarnation of Christ in all things, it's now. The primordial sacrament, the very sustaining planet without which this is the only home we have ever known. There's nowhere to go. This is it, right? This is that sacrament, that beautiful gift of, of, um, of God's presence. So what we come to realize, I think, in all of this, is um, what I talk about in my book that 
the contemplative life is not just some quaint little pastime or a tidy little spiritual practice that nice people engage in. It is a profoundly countercultural commitment to seeing the deep unity of all things and living out of that unity, born of love and compassion, no matter what. I'm sure most of you know uh, people who are of a different religious persuasion, Buddhists or Kabbalists or Sufi, who, are, who don't share the same Christian convictions, but with whom you probably feel more intimately connected than those Christians who merely sort of practice this externalized ritualistic view. That's because there is this great unity that we recognize in one another that transcends all of the, the trappings, religious and cultural, but which all of them are, of course, trying to point to and get at. It's just so present. Leanne, please. As I mentioned in earlier on, I live in a very small community and it is filled with predominantly uh, German families that have been here for over 150 years. And what I noticed when I moved here was this incredible spirit of helping others. And my neighbors will drop whatever they're doing, no matter how important it is to them to come and help me. And so the other day I received a phone call from a neighbor saying, hey, can you come help me? And that just made me so happy to hear, you know, a neighbor who is so competent and can do anything, but to ask for my help. And I went running, said, oh my gosh, I'll be over there in 10 minutes. And it was just to put my finger on a tube to feel if air was coming out because something in his air conditioning system was clogged and he needed another person. Mm -hmm. And it was so simple, but it was going to save him a lot of money using me rather than calling the air conditioner pe person to come that would have to travel a half an hour to get to us. So I just, you know, I'm so happy that I live in this community where I, I they're, they are the others to me politically. They're so different from me, but I have found this common ground with um, our need for each other. Mm -hmm. And it's a deep seated need because we reach out to each other. They come over when I'm in tears about a wedding or whatever I'm doing because I live by myself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we'll go a week without seeing anyone. Mm -hmm. But I also have noticed being here, um, you know, we talk about science and the benefits of science. And I've also seen how our reliance on science in terms of our use of our iPhones to figure out what the weather is gonna be like and it's taken away from our ability to look at nature and to see what the weather might be like because of the signs. And my neighbors have told me stories about, you know, the old ones, the grandfathers that could look at the creek and see something in the creek that would tell them that, you know, rain was coming in three days, or they would know from the way their bones were feeling that a norther was coming in. And those are, sound like quaint things that we can uh, dismiss, but they're not. They're really signs that because we spend so much time, we can pick up our phone and look at what things are gonna be like. We dismiss what mother nature is telling us every right. day. Right, exactly right. If it, we could look on our phones to see what the temperature is outside, or we can actually just walk out the door for a second and know what the temperature is, you know? So there, you know, and there's that deep sense, you know, um, Leanne, something that, you know, your comments uh, reminded me of is coming back to that Matthew 25 passage. Um, uh, remember when Jesus is asked in, an, in a different context, um, you know, what must I do to, to have eternal life in a sense and love God and love neighbor. And then the question by the lawyer who he's dialoguing with says, well, who is my neighbor? 
And from this, Jesus gives the parable of the Good Samaritan. The conclusion to be drawn from that is that your neighbor is someone in need. That's your neighbor. And whether it's to put your hand over the hole of an air-conditioned pipe or to help somebody who's been beat up and left for dead on the side of the road, the neighbor is, is the one in need, right? Not someone who can help me. I recognize my neighbor as one in need. That's the call to Christian discipleship. And in Matthew 25, it is precisely that fulfillment of need, right? The embodiment of God's love through the gift of food or water or visitation or healing that becomes the way in which we embody that love in the world. And you did a beautiful job putting your finger in that little hole <laughs> because there was a neighbor in need. Do you know what I mean? It's sometimes that simple and that's all it has to be. It's a beautiful thing. And also the resilience of human beings and speaking to, to Mary Jane, I can see how resilient she is in, in this time of, um, of grief. And I see also from the, the, you know, the freeze, the big freeze that we had here in Texas, the resilience of our plants, mm -hmm. things that plants that we thought were dead, given months and months and months, and all of a sudden something is springing forth, life is coming through. And to me, you know, th plants that were about to be taken out and cut down, eliminated, pulled out, yanked out of the ground, and yet there was life there. It just took a while to come forth. Indeed, yeah, life is tenacious, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> One thing I, I might like to introduce in the time we have remaining is this concept of disconnect as the spiritual malady, if you want to say, the spiritual illness that we are suffering under uh, that is leading to this deeper uh, problem. We were talking about retracting into biblical fundamentalism um, as a way of preserving a sense of safety that one has um, around a world that has become much more gray, diverse, a lacking kind of clear sense of direction for us, right? In this postmodern world. And the reaction is people get fearful and retract into I'm right, you're wrong, black and white, fundamentalist views and, and so forth. Very hardened positions. I, I want you to pay attention to what, what happens with the fundamentalist reading of scripture. Notice how what predominates is what we call proof texting, which means you extract one verse from somewhere in the Bible and then claim to know what that verse means. Apply it universally, right? We know as biblical scholars that that is the worst way you can try to interpret scripture. Everything makes sense in its context and outside of context, it's very difficult to make sense of anything. So in order to understand that one little verse of scripture, the goal is not to remove it, proof text it and say, here it is in black and white, this is what it means, but rather to keep it in its context and see its relationality to everything else being said in scripture so that it can all kind of inform. And that's how before the modern world, in the pre-modern world, that's how scripture was understood as a, as a little, as a kind of landscape in itself, which was cross-referenced, self-referential. This allegorized that. We saw, for example, in those five columns I gave you yesterday, how, how in one Peter, he could say, you remember the ark, no, and the ark, that prefigures baptism. That's a way in which scripture is being self-referential. I mean, there's nothing obvious about the fact that the ark represents baptism. It's only interpreted that way later. And then you say, oh yeah, I can see the connections now. Everything has a kind of cross-reference and, and meaning. When you just pull something out of it, you lose that ability. And that is, I think, what fundamentalism has done with the Bible separated verses from one another and tried to make sense of them as independent, isolated, disconnected units. And that is the same thing I think we've seen in science. Empiricism, what you see on the surface, this experiment, that movement of light, the way that this functions here, has all been separated from the cohesiveness of nature. And science has pigeonholed everything and thereby diminished nature's capacity to be self-referential, to, to have symbolic value. We just see things as isolated, which is why we kept missing the fact 
that the incursions we were making into um, natural landscapes, the rainforests, right? The destruction, the incursion of humanity into like every corner of the earth. We couldn't see how each of these, what we thought were isolated biospheric centers, a mountain, a rainforest, the ocean, were actually completely dependent and reliant on one another as a cohesive whole. So we divided up the world, incurred on all these individual aspects, just the way fundamentalism divides up the scriptures and sees things in isolation. In both cases, we're learning you can't do that and make meaning of it. The environmental crisis we face today is demanding a reevaluation of our understanding of the interdependence of everything. You move, you, you, the smallest fish in that river over the mountain goes extinct, and all of a sudden the implications reverberate in ways we had never imagined. The contemplative life is in some ways a restoration of that ancient wholeness, a countercultural move against the divisions, the bifurcations, the pigeonholing of scriptural texts and of creation, species, okay? And this is what I call disconnect. The famous conservationist John Muir wrote this one time in his journals. He says, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find that it is bound fast by a thousand invisible cords that cannot be broken to everything in the universe. Bound fast, he says, or in another journal talking about the same thing, he says, everything in the universe is hitched to everything else. Everything in scripture is hitched to everything else. You can't proof text. You can't understand what's being said in the Bible if you just pull out one verse and think you've got it all. You've got to see it all interconnected. And that is the truth in, in the big book of creation as well. Everything is hitched to everything else. So in this both modern and particularly the postmodern world, I'm suggesting here that we've forgotten how to read this big book of scripture, just as we've forgotten how to read the little book. And this is the quote then that I would like to cite for you from my book, um, which comes spans pages 104 to 105 for anybody who might have it and would wanna know where I'm taking this from. I write this. The pervasive disconnect between modern societies and the natural world opened the way for entire species of plants, animals, and ecosystems to be exploited in acquiescence to every human whim and desired luxury. The majestic beauty of elephants poached only for their tusks, the gentle magnificence of seal pups brutally clubbed to death for a tuft of their fur. The destruction of forests and their inhabitants to make room for new factories or farmlands to meet the demands of wealthy nations. The perpetuation of suffering and mutilation of farm animals in the name of higher yields of meat production. Thus the illusion of separation and the reduction of the whole to its parts or corollaries of one another, both a result of our failure to perceive the unity of the kingdom of God within ourselves and the world around us. This is a kind of spiritual blindness that leads to moral failure, driven by our attachment to satiate every passion and material desire rather than face the void within. And the first casualty of this kind of moral failure is beauty, or rather our ability to be touched and transformed by beauty, a beauty that once perceived will forever compel us toward the good, toward truth itself. Indeed, beauty is as elusive as it is universal, but for the Christian contemplative, it is inseparable from the unifying vision of the kingdom of God, a vision that is able to perceive the whole in all of its parts, the body of Christ in each of its members. You see, so this idea of the contemplative life as a restoration 
of a vision of unity, of living into an expansive unity, is key to helping us overcome the pragmatic problems we face around the environmental crisis. Yes, we have to throw scientific and pragmatic solutions at the problem, no doubt. We have to invest trillions of dollars. We have to invest new technologies. We have to transform old technologies. All of these pragmatic solutions are essential. But what's as essential is that we understand the fundamental spiritual malady the illness that lies beneath it all. And it is the illness, the spiritual malady of disconnect, the perception that we are separate from God and one another. That illusion drives this entire catastrophe. And the contemplative life is countercultural precisely because it insists to the contrary that all are one. And it doesn't just insist in an academic or theoretical way but an experiential reality in which the beauty of that wholeness becomes perceptible. That movement from chaos to order or chaos to providence, where we can discern the unity of Christ in all things, binding all things. Remember, Christ holds all things in existence. Sunestikin is that beautiful Greek word in the hymn, holding all things. It is the, the capacity for us to embrace and perceive and live into that reality. From there, our behavior conforms to the reality we now perceive. Our way of being in the world becomes an expression of that great unity. The urgency of the contemplative life in this day and age is nothing less than planetary. This is what I plan to move into a bit more tomorrow. What, how might we begin to inculcate very simple practices? Um, a lot of members of First Nations or the Native traditions lived what we call ceremonially. They had little ceremonies or rituals that, that they just did discreetly. Very often that would connect them to the animals they hunted, to the crops they yielded, to the berries they picked, to the land they inhabited. How might we in our own Christian contemplative context think through or even invent personal rituals, ways of reminding ourselves, um, not just in our heads, but actions we might perform that might help restore our sense of this connectedness? Could be as simple as what we talked about earlier. Stop looking at your cell phone to figure out the temperature outside. Walk outside for two minutes. Breathe in the air. Let your body tell you if you need that jacket or not. Uh, if it, when you leave the house, just be present in it. Even something that simple. That's the kind of rituals I'm talking about. A commitment to very simple ways of being that will help reconnect us, right? Al, Al, um, Aldof Leopold said, we only mourn what we know. If you don't know the creation that's dying before your eyes, you won't mourn it. And if you don't mourn it, you're not going to try to save it. Mourning becomes a ritual practice. Mary Jane, your own experience, I know, my own experience of my recent loss of my father, mourning is a practice, it's a teacher, it guides us, it's horrifically painful. But something comes fruitful of it over time. How can our mourning over what we're losing throughout the world be a, be a way of allowing our hearts to break that moves us to action? I have a final poem I would like to read for us, Vincent. Sure. Of course. By our beautiful friend, uh, Mary Oliver, who mm. has such a lovely way of bringing the natural world in. So we'll go out with the words of Mary Oliver in her poem called One. The mosquito is so small, it takes almost nothing to ruin it. Each leaf the same. And the black ant hurrying. So many lives, so many fortunes. Every morning I walk softly and with forward glances down to the ponds and through the pine woods. Mushrooms even have but a brief hour 
before the slug creeps to the feast, before the pine needles hustle down under the bundles of harsh, beneficent rain. How many, how many, how many make up a world? And then I think of that old idea, the singular and the eternal. One cup in which everything is swirled back to the color of the sea and the sky. Imagine it, a shining cup, surely. In the moment in which there is no wind over your shoulder, you stare down into it and there you are, your own darling face, your own eyes. And then the wind, not thinking of you, just passes by, touching the ant, the mosquito, the leaf, and you know what else. How blue is the sea? How blue is the sky? How blue and tiny and redeemable everything is. Even you, even your eyes, even your imagination.